Hi, welcome to another live fast forward conversation. And with me are the amazing writers, Kay Tempest Bradford and Alethea Contis. Welcome to Fast Forward, you two. Thank, Thank you for having you. us. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. There's so much to talk about because one thing is, oh, let me get this out of the way. Don't forget people to subscribe, like, uh, click the bell, do all that stuff because it helps us. Okay, that's out of the way. So <laughs> Kathy won't be mad at me. Um, <laughs> let's start by talking about the big news, which is that you guys both have new books coming out. Yeah. And they're coming out on the same day, I understand. <laughs> yes. Was this coincidence or was this plotting and planning <laughs> that went on for years for you two? Total coincidence. Like, and as a matter of fact, uh, because Alethea didn't necessarily even remember what my pub date was when she was telling me, she's like, oh yeah, this this book I have coming out is coming out on September 27th. I was like, wait a minute, that date is familiar. That's when my book is coming out. <laughs> Hold up. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about your book, Tempest. Um, Ruby Finley versus the Interstellar Invasion. Yeah. And there's the cover. It's a great cover. Thank you. Um, I'm so happy. <laughs> yeah. So tell us a little bit about it. Um, so it's a middle grade novel. So it's for ages like 8 to 12-ish. Um, and it's about a 11-year-old Black girl who is a genius. And she really loves bugs. And she wants to be an entomologist someday. And so when she's, you know, in her yard one day, she sees the strangest bug ever. And because she's, you know, an entomologist, she's like, I have to study it. So she scoops it up and takes it inside. But she can't figure out what it is um, because she's, like, you know, this is not in any, any of the books that I have, you know, talking about bugs. And she like tries searching on the internet. And so she decides to open up her Twitter account, which she's not supposed to have because she's only 11 and ask, you know, people on uh, Twitter if they know what the bug is. So she takes a picture, she makes the tweet, she turns around, the bug is no longer in the jar. And she's like, where'd the bug go? And then she looks over at her window and the bug is like burning a hole through the screen in her window and escaping out. She's like, what the heck? And then she goes looking for it, can't find it. And then she's just like, this is weird. And while she's sitting there trying to figure out what to do, men in black suits uh, in fancy black cars show up asking about the bug. And um, strange things start to happen uh, around the neighborhood. And nobody has seen the lady who lives down the block who doesn't talk to anybody for a while. And... Um, so she's got to figure out what the heck is going on. Um, and I, I wrote this book because of Alethea. <laughs> um, yeah, like I was with Alethea um, and I guess it was like 2019, wasn't it? And I uh, have a habit of going to Florida when it is cold in the north. I'm like, I'm taking myself to Florida where it is you're warm. in New York, right? Well, I was in New York. Um, now uh. I live in Portland, Oregon. And so... Oh. Uh, I'm like, I need to take myself to where it's warm because like Portland, Oregon in the winter is just like clouds. Um, it's clouds and, and that's it. So I was visiting Alethea and we were both trying to write. And I said, okay, we need some inspiration. Let's play this game that um, I've been playing for a really long time. I play with a lot of my students. It's called the picture game where you like find a cool picture that inspires you. And then you like take 10 to 15 minutes and you just write about it. And I had been holding on to this picture for a while of like a little black girl and like this thing coming out of a wall at her. And she's like fighting it off with a super soaker gun. And um, I, I had been holding on to it like for playing the game. And so what, once we did, um, the thing that I wrote, we actually went for 20 minutes because both of us were like super into what we were writing. And so like Alethea read her thing. It was really fun and cool. And then I read mine. And when I was done, she dead ass looked at me and was like, you know, that's the first chapter of a middle grade novel, right? And I was like, what are you talking about? No, I don't write middle grade. I have other things to do. And um, she kept telling me that it was a middle grade novel uh, until I finally believed her and I wrote it. <laughs> well, it sounds wonderful. And even though I'm not the demographic for it, I would probably buy it and read it because it sounds great it is a book that the world needed and i wanted to impress upon her how much the world needed that book so i'm so yes. so, so happy that it exists <laughs> yes well and why I don't we talk it was really good <laughs> why don't we talk a little bit about your new book oh my gosh um, oodles of doodles 
oodles of <laughs> oodles of doodle, which I have to say is really hard to read without cracking up. It just <laughs> it just isn't. And and honestly, the best way to describe the story is to describe the origin of it, which was I was with my friend Kate and her two daughters, and we were on a side trip. I go up north every fall, and we were on a side trip to Salem, I think. Anyway, we were in the car for a long time, and we just started talking about. I don't even know who started the whole do do you doodle? Does your poodle doodle? My poodle doodles oodles. Does your can you doodle? Can you doodle poodles? And we just it just flowed like that. And so I was like, wait, I need to write this down. I need to write this down. I had no idea what to do with this absolutely ridiculous story. And I talked to a friend who is a comedian and he said that I needed to like do research and watch a lot of Marx Brothers movies and all of these things. And I'm like, I am not a smart enough comedian to write the book the way it needs to be written. Um, and then when I went to picture book boot camp one year, we were at the highlights campus and I, it was probably the last day and I've been pulling everything out of my trunk to present to everyone because I have them there and they're, uh, have their attention. I want them to look at my stuff. So they're like the very last thing I'm like, well, I got this oodle doodle story. I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> Heidi Semple loved it so much. She told her friend about it, who just so happens to be an editor at Simon and Schuster. And ta-da, and I don't think, I, I think I maybe had to change two words. <laughs> and Heidi ought to know. Yep. <laughs> Anyone's going to know that, Heidi's going to know that. Yep. yep. So it turns out that it's it's um, even younger than the Alpha Oops books, which oh. I, I was, I mean, I'm aware of all the different levels. It just never occurred to me that I could write for those levels the ready to read levels are split into five um and honestly i i love level zero and level one i think this is a level one ready to read book um i would love to write more of them i really really <laughs> enjoyed it that's something now what what has come up here with you guys talking about these new books is your friendship that made it through if I remember correctly, when lockdown hit from the pandemic, you guys got locked in together down in Florida, <laughs> yes. and you're both still alive. <laughs> <laughs> we survived. But it's it's mainly because um, we had been spending time together before this. Like, I would go to Florida and stay with Lethe for like a month, two months sometimes. And so we were actually like quite used to living with each other. Plus, we already had the online shared workspace way before lockdown. <laughs> yeah. We were, all, we were like hipsters with the Zoom thing. So. <laughs> it's like I've been doing Zoom since before it was cool yeah. with all of my friends. So, yeah, we um, – and, and that's why – one of the reasons why I enjoy going down to Florida other than the warmth is because I would go to Lithia's and then we would, like, talk about the books that we um, were thinking of, brainstorm off of each other um, – <laughs> so much promotional work. We do a lot so of promotional, promotional work. work. <laughs> yeah. And, and we support That's each other important. through things like um because the the time when I was there when I when I wrote the thing that eventually became uh Ruby Finley versus the Interstellar Invasion, um I one of the reasons why I was like, I'm not writing that novel that you say I have to write is because I was writing another novel and that novel fell apart. Like I was mm. in the car with Alethea driving somewhere boo-hooing about how that novel was falling apart. And, and she was like, well, we have to do this. And she sat with me while I like rejiggered the whole thing and, and restructured the whole novel. And I'm still, I still have to write that thing, but um, it was it, like, that was the perfect place to sort of have that breakdown <laughs> because I had that breakdown with, with someone who understands. So yeah. it was, it was great. That's, that's good. The friendships like that, you can't buy them. No. Nope. Yeah. No, they're special, um, which leads me into something else that you guys do together because you both do kind of training and classes and working with writers on things. And together you do these fun and writing game salon mm -hmm. that you do. So I'm not a writer. <laughs> I'm a reader. Um, somebody's got to read this stuff. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how does that work? How do those things work? They come off of a Patreon, I believe. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. We... Go ahead, Alethea. You tell them. 
The Patreon is sort of like a cover charge. I mean, it's very yeah. little money uh, to come hang out with us. Again, it's like a shared workspace. Anyone can come. We have them at random days and times once a month. Uh, sometimes twice a month if we have skipped or someone has to go storm chasing. Uh, and we'll uh, get to that. And we right. And we play games because you know, Tempest and I are always, you know, she'll say, We should play this picture game. And I whine. <laughs> I'm <laughs> whining about playing games like that. And then once I do, I'm like, I'm so glad we play this game every single time. <laughs> it happens yep. that way every single time. So uh, yeah, we. I can't even remember what games we started out. We, I think we that, did. We started out with it being um, a limited sort of class. It wasn't really a class because we weren't class, teaching anybody right. anything. Right, because you and I were teaching classes together. So we did a like a game workshop, mm -hmm. not an untrademarked games workshop. Yeah. Um, and, and the first games we played were ones that were specifically they're like solo writing games. They're called lonely, lonely games. games. Yeah, lonely okay. games. Yeah, and so uh, so there's a book called Lonely Games. Um, you could buy it on I think Drive Through RPG and Itch.io, um, and I believe that they're still credited to Brie Bo Larson, but I believe Brie has a well. I know that Brie has a different name that they go by now, but I believe it's still credited on those sites as Brie Larson. Um, who and it's called Lonely Games of the Imagination, and it's a uh, sort of an anthology of these different games that are essentially like uh, a sort of opening that sort of sets the world, and then writing prompts like questions, and then you can take however long to like answer the question, and by the end of it, like you may have sort of created um, a story. You've gone through a narrative. Um, and so what we would do is like we would get together in a group of people, and we would all play the game together. And of course, because like we're all different people, um, we all came up with very different, you know, scenarios, narratives, things that we focused on, et cetera, as we played these games. Um, and originally, like, yeah, we, we did it where it was like for we did it for two weeks and then we had one week extra in case anybody wanted to like make a lonely game of their own because, you know, it's a pretty simple thing. And what we kind of like we knew might work, might be a thing, but we didn't expect it to be as strong as it was, is that people, writers really, really resonated with this because a lot of them were very much feeling like they couldn't write anymore. I think we did this at the beginning of 2021, didn't we? Right. So we were like a year into the pandemic and a lot of writers were just feeling like their writing had left them. Like they, they just couldn't write anymore. from other writers and any sort of yeah. conversation like that. Half the time we would play the game and then talk for half an hour afterwards. Just yeah, about everything. Yeah. And just so to have actual contact. With yeah. Yeah. And, and it was, uh, you know, just really beautiful seeing how many people really felt like they were like, I thought that my creativity had left me, but it didn't because like they would do these games and they would get really inspired. And then um, we're working right now on uh, putting together a book of lonely games from the people who were in that class and us. Right. Um, so we did another one later in the year. We played a different game. I think we played Sugar Porridge Spoons with that one. And again, it was so great because like everybody was really enjoying like having the time together with other writers and, and being able to like be creative in a non-pressure environment. Cause we're like, you know, you don't have to read a, to, to us the thing. You don't even have to do anything with it. You could just write it and put it in a drawer, like no pressure. And so then I was talking to Alethea. I said, what if we like did this every month? You know, we just played a different writing game every month with folks. Um, and, uh, and so that's that's how the Patreon came about, and so that and that's what we do. Huh. It sounds great. It really, I mean, it's a lot of have fun. A link, we will have a link uh, in comments and stuff to get to the Lonely Games book, and uh, for the Patreon for the uh, the game salon that you guys do. Uh, Tempest, you do some other writing teaching that I think is very important that I want to talk a little bit about, which is the writing the other classes that you do, um, that, that really is helping create inclusive and diverse uh, fiction around. And you've got deep dives. you got one coming up with in dialogue, dialect, and narrative voice, I believe. We just got done with that one. The one that is uh, coming up uh, uh, next month, 
because it's May already. <laughs> How's it May? Um, the one that's coming up next month is actually our deep dive into description uh, because ah. that's another area where a lot of writers get really nervous. You know, they're like, how do I describe a person who's not like me? Is it okay to describe them? Like, should I use food metaphors? Don't use food metaphors. But, <laughs> but yeah, yeah we... I find Go it ahead. really fascinating. The, the, I love the fact that these classes are being taught to, you know, I think it, the more I can see people that aren't me in, in the books I read, the more I like it. I don't need to read about, you know, middle-aged old cishet white men because I are one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to read, I, I read fiction and particularly science fiction and fantasy to read about things and people that aren't me that are different. And so I love the fact that, you know, these classes are, are helping people do that. Yeah. I think it's important. We I love teaching them. Um, I w was inspired by Nisi Shaw and Cynthia Ward, who wrote the book Writing the Other, which is like the, you know, the foundational text. And um, the way that I came about being involved is just that um, I was talking to uh, my friend Mary Robinette Kowal about doing a writing retreat because uh, she had just started doing the writing excuses retreats. Like this was, oh my goodness, back in the day before there was a cruise ship. We were having just like on land retreats and, you know, she was telling me about how well the first one had gone. And I said, we should try to do like a writing the other treat retreat. That would be great. And she's like, that's a great idea. So we talked to Nisi and Cynthia about it. We got David Anthony Durham to come. Um, and we did, uh, you know, just like they, Nisi and uh, Cynthia already had like a seminar that they gave, which is basically just the book, just in seminar form. And so they did that. We had some extra conversations. Um, we had some writing time. It was really great. And in talking to Nisi about it, I said, you know, Nisi, more people I think would be really interested in um, coming to these retreats if they could have some of the basic stuff, say, in an online class first. And then we handle like more advanced stuff at the retreats. And she said, I don't know how to do online classes. And I said, let me call my friend Mary Robinette Cole, <laughs> who had been doing online classes for a couple of years, I think, at that point. And I was like, Mary, teach me how to do this. And, and Mary Robinette taught me how to do it. And then uh, I started doing it for Nisi and myself. And eventually we were like, if we keep doing this, we could turn it into a business. <laughs> and so that is what we did. Um, but, but also I was uh, really driven by the fact that, yes, yeah, so many people really wanted to learn the skill. And so many writers are like scared sometimes to do it because they have seen what happens when you do it wrong. They have seen all the stuff that happens on the internet when you do it wrong. But also because, you know, they're like, yeah, I want to make my book reflective of the actual world, but I just really need the tools to make that happen. And so um, we just started giving more and more classes and expanding it. And we keep like growing and growing the type of classes that we do. And it's all really great. And I'm just really thankful that I get to work with Nisi every day because they are so <laughs> awesome and wonderful and have, you know, they have always been a mentor to me, like ever since I was a young writer. And so getting to work with Nisi is really the best part of all this. Nisi is that's exciting. That's, that's exciting. And like I said, it's, it's important. It's important work. Um, let's, let's move to something a little different because you guys have, are travelers too. You both went together uh, with another friend, I believe, to Egypt. Yep. Recently. Um, what was the driving force for that? And what was it like? Like this, wherever she is on the screen, that she was the driving <laughs> force of that. And she was the reason that it was absolutely amazing and epic from beginning to end. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I. Uh, had been to Egypt once before and I went uh, for a research trip essentially uh, for that book that fell apart. Um, and then I just absolutely fell in love with Egypt. And so I was like, I'm going back again. I'm going to make it happen. And uh, I you invited my house when that got funded. The first That's true. Time. That's I true. Like, there's, that. there's a gift somewhere of us like going like this. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> because somebody gave me like a huge chunk of money to get me right to my goal. And I was just like screaming. Um, so yeah, so I was like, I'm, I'm going back to Egypt. And I said, this time I'm bringing people. So I was like, Alethea, do you want to come? And she was like, I'll be there immediately. So yeah. 
Um, and then we had we had a really good time. What was your favorite part of that trip, Alethea? Yeah. <gasps> oh, the, the balloon ride, maybe? The balloon ride. She has to go up on a hot air balloon. You did a that balloon was, ride? That was on my, long before there was a thing called a bucket list, I had on my blog the things, the, I called it the princess list, the things Princess Alethea wants to do before she dies. And on that list, the original list from a million years ago was to ha go up in a hot air balloon. I have always wanted to do this thing. And apparently Egypt is one of the only places where like you can do this thing or that it's so incredibly well known. Like I didn't realize how famous the Luxor balloon ride was. Um, and well, the balloon ride over, oh my God. You know, one, yeah. one, two, you can either go over Hatshepsut's temple or um, the Valley of the Kings. And the day that I went, because it was like our last day in Luxor, um, uh, we went over Hatshepsut's temple and it was, and the sun was rising because you have to go up. There's physics. There's reasons you need to go like, <laughs> at dawn. Um, and the sun was rising. And this one is over at Hatshepsut's temple. So as the sun is rising, I'm taking pictures of the temple because I'm like, oh, Tempest is really going to love that. And I posted it online and she says, that's me right there. That little black hat <laughs> on the stairs. I took a picture of her at the temple from my balloon and there's a shadow of the balloon on the mountains like that was the coolest thing <laughs> so you photobombed her picture from, from the i photobombed i've i photobombed alethea's picture because like the the one of the reasons why we went um in uh december of last year and one of the reasons why i wanted to go is because uh that temple of hatshepsut is um or at least it was at one point aligned to the sunrise on the winter solstice and i wanted to experience that because like oh. a lot of temples in egypt are aligned to uh either a specific like you know it's equinox sunrise it's the solstice sunrise um or there's like stars in the sky where like we want the stars to come through these windows on these days and whatnot they they planned out these things like all the time so at one point, uh, that temple was aligned to the winter solstice. And I wanted to experience that because like the sun is supposed to come in and like light up a certain thing on that day. So the day we went the day before, all three of us for the sunrise at Hatshepsut's temple. And it was beautiful and amazing. What we discovered that day, though, is that the alignment is off because they haven't actually moved that temple since it was built. Um, yeah. whereas other temples around ancient Egypt do get moved as the alignment changes. Oh, and really? so the Karnak temple, which is the famous one that is aligned to the winter uh, solstice sunrise. And there's tons of people who come to Karnak on that day. The Karnak temple's alignment is correct because it, you know, up until um, about a thousand, maybe 1500 years ago was still actively being used. So they would like shift it. You know, and and this is actually um, there was a uh, the guy who basically invented astro archaeology was the one who first said you can tell that they have shifted these temples because the foundations are different in different time periods. And at first nobody believed him, but now it's like a whole field, right? Um, and so, but they didn't do that to a Shepsut's temple and there's like lots of complicated reasons for it. So we were able to see like, it was beautiful. The summer is beautiful that we experienced together, but it didn't like align exactly, exactly. Um, but I, I wanted to experience that because I'm writing about it in one of my novels, one of my future novels. So when Alethea decided that she was going to go up in the hot air balloon, since we had to drive to that side of the river anyway, I was like, can you just drop me off at Hatshepsut's temple? I will be there during the sunrise and she could be up in the hot air balloon. And so, yeah, I was like sitting on the steps and watching all the hot air balloons going up, trying to figure out which one Alethea was in. <laughs> and everybody else was further into the temple trying to experience like seeing the, the sunlight come through the temple. But since I had experienced that the day before, I was actually sitting on the stairs. And that's why you can see little black dot that is me <laughs> in Alethea's picture, um, which I thought was like really great. Because at first when I saw it, I was like, wait a minute. And I zoomed in. I'm like, that's me. <laughs> it was so perfect. Well, I, you did a ancient Egypt story. What is it? The Copper Scarab, I think. Yes. Um, that was in, I think, uh, it was in Clockwork Cairo. That was the first yeah. anthology it was published in. And then it got reprinted in Sunspot, um, Sunspot, Sunspot Jungle. Jungle. 
Yeah, yeah volume uh, one. Rosarium, yeah, Bill. Bill's yeah. <laughs> and, and like Bill was He's great. A he was like, the, Bill's a friend of the show. We've had Yeah, it. Bill was great. And he was like, I need this story. You're going to have to give it to me. I was like, uh, yes, sir. You can have it. And it's set in the same world yeah. as um, the, the novel that I was writing and the reason why I was going to Egypt. And, you know, a lot of that also is like about like getting the sun to align in the right way so that the copper scarab can fly. So is that is this the steampunk that yes. you're, you're working on? So it's yeah. ancient Egypt steampunk. That's right. And it's the it's short all, story is great. Thank you. Yeah, it's all steam that is uh heated like it's water heated up by the sun because you know, you got a lot of things in Egypt, including a lot of sun. <laughs> yeah. So much. So sun. that's what you're working on. Alethea, is there anything you're working on right now particularly? I just finished a ghost story for Gabby Triana's uh, ghost anthology, the name of which is slipping my mind at the moment, but I'm sure it will be out this fall for Halloween. Um, and it's, uh, according to my assistant, the best story I've ever written. And the last story I wrote was her favorite story ever. So this one even surpasses that one, which was the Marie Curie story, which I think is also coming out in an anthology this year. So in the in between writing all these other little things, I... Um, have been I have still been keeping up with my with my short stories. I don't write as many as I used to, but I think I'm up to maybe 50 published short stories or just just shy of 50. Um, but yeah, Ghost Lake Mermaid is unlike anything I have ever written before. And I I gotta say I really do love it. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. And we were talking about travel. Uh Alethea, you do some special traveling. You've done it for a bit now where you go storm chasing. I do. And I talked to my storm chase partner today and we may leave. I, I'm usually packed by May 1st. It is May 2nd and I'm still not 100% packed. Um, we don't usually leave until around May 15th, but this year we may leave on Thursday. Uh, so Ooh. because things have just been very active out there. Uh, Chris Chris is also a writer, a writer Chris Kreidler. Um, she's, she has many novels under her belt and we decided that if there is some kind of death ridge in the middle of all of these lovely storms that are happening, we can just have a writer's retreat out in Tornado yeah. Alley. We don't need to come all the way back to Florida. We can just pause, have a mini chill out. Um, last year was so epic. We chased for three weeks straight without a break. Yeah. I was following your your posts about it your pictures were gorgeous it it's was beautiful yeah. it was exhaust i mean we had no downtime i still haven't seen the great the giant ball of string um i was this close to mount rushmore i was this close to carhenge i just didn't get to go see them because you're chasing storms and the storms are going in a different direction um you're not there to sightsee and i feel bad because so many people find out i'm going out west and they all want me to come visit but i right i'm like got, hey there's storms there's tornadoes in Portland, I think. Maybe you should place them here. <laughs> no, there's not. That's, that's, not, <laughs> there's that's a, not how this works. That's actually, this is why I live in Portland is because there there's was tornadoes or here. There grapple or something. You had, you had grapple and did a little weather report. Yes. About it. it was fabulous. Yes. <laughs> that whole day and was just weird. So, yeah. <laughs> by the way, people can buy Oz or Bus, which is, that's what you call it go storm chasing they can buy yes. t-shirts and stuff and your website uh yes at my website there's a an oz or bust like the little graphic that goes across the top of the screen and there's a page you can go to and see the highlights the of my storm chase trips uh but definitely follow me on instagram that's where yeah. most of the good good stuff happens and you it's do awesome you do little videos while you're there and pictures yes, Chris and, and it's I really neat been so like our videos we hate doing them and then when we look at them later we're like we're adorable and we really should do more <laughs> so our goal now, this year is to do more live videos cool 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 by the way one of the things i love about both of your work is that you guys work in like almost every genre any kind of fiction you guys do it thank you and, and non-fiction too you both do stuff for npr Mm -hmm. um tempest you you wrote ravenloft stuff for D yeah. D 5e which i play my Yay. wife and i've been playing D D since 78 ah uh, awesome and we're still we're still playing i it's it's interesting because like i have been sort of like tiptoeing into you know the gaming world and being able to work on ravenloft was so cool because um you know like 
Wizards of the Coast, Wizards of the Coast, is doing a lot of work to like update D and D to make sure that it's still like fun and it still has like the the core elements that are great. But to sort of update some of the things, it's like, oh, that was that was not the greatest. That was yeah. uh, that was a little bit weird. And so when um. I was brought in to work on Ravenloft. They brought me in specifically to work on the domain of Harakir because um, they were all aware of like all my Egypt stuff. And they're like, come work on the Egypt world. I'm like, okay. And they were like, oh, there's some things in the past. We're, we, we don't necessarily need to have that, but you know, you can look at some of the older stuff to, to get a taste. And so, yeah, when I read through this stuff, I was like, oh, I'm going to keep this. This I'm not going to keep. I'm going to put that over there. But, um, but mostly like I was really... I, I love like the feel of it because it's like sort of, you know, a little bit based on the mummy, like Universal Studios, original mummy, and a little bit based on other, you know, things in D and D. And they gave me a lot of free reign to just like, you know, make it like more intense or more spooky. Um, and at one point they were like, maybe like one of the pyramids can be like a dungeon. And I was like, I got something better for you. <laughs> um, because uh, like one of the things I really love was like incorporating stuff that really is from ancient Egypt in it. And so um, the, the Giza Plateau, which is where, you know, like the three big famous pyramids are, but there's like actually like a ton of pyramids in Egypt. We went into nine of them. Um, there's a ton of pyramids, um, but on the Giza I Plateau- I rode a camel. That was- rode a camel. Thing. <laughs> And, um, and so like, there's all these pyramids that everybody knows about, but what most people don't know is that Giza also has a, a tunnel system that runs throughout, like for miles and miles that um, archeologists are not in total agreement about what that tunnel system is for. Um, but it's like a lot of interconnected subterranean caves. And so that is why in Harakir, I put the labyrinth underneath the sands because I was like, you know, we could have a dungeon and this dungeon could pop up anywhere. It could pop up inside one of the pyramids. It could pop up over there in that Acropolis. It could pop up in this, you know, uh, oasis mm -hmm. over here. Um, and I liked being able to incorporate that because you could still keep the dungeon part of Dungeons and Dragons, but it's not necessarily like we're going to rob that guy's tomb. It's more like we're going through here and oh no, there's mummies. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was pretty, that was so much fun. As, as happens. Yeah, right. You're just walking around. You're like, oh, mummy. Um, <laughs> mummy. A mummy. Because like I was saying, you guys do all kinds of stuff. And um, Aletheia, you do um, audio narration. I do. You, you were a child actor. I and do. now you're doing audio narration um, in, in audio books. And you've been doing some songwriting, I understand. Well, not as much. <laughs> I mean, you see my lovely, this is George, the guitar. <laughs> um, I, I have not played her. She's named after George Payne uh, from Nancy Drew because guitars have to be named after women, right? But I wanted to name her George. Um, yeah, not as much songwriting. I um, I have written more poetry. Um, I used to be a really good poet when I was a teenager. I know so many people look down on the poetry they wrote when they were a teenager, but I just read a poem the other day that I wrote when I was 16 and I could have written it yesterday. It was so insightful and deep and lyrical. And I miss that part of that muscle, wherever that is. Um, so I, I have been trying to do more poetry and delve into that. But yeah, the audiobook thing and the podcast thing like oh my gosh i can't even remember when i started doing that i was reading fairy tales to myself on my laptop and putting them on my website like i um and when when brilliance sold enchant or when harcourt sold enchanted to brilliance uh, I knew the people at Brilliance and they said do you want to record your own audiobook <laughs> i I said, unfortunately, I know enough to know I am not good enough to record my own audiobook. Um, and they asked me who I wanted, and I said, Catherine Kelgren. And they're like, she's going to be really expensive. I don't know if she'll do it. And I said, can you just ask her? And she said, yes. And then she did. So, and then she did. And then she did. Um, God, I miss, I miss Katie. I'm so glad she got to do Enchanted Hero and Dearest. They are just, I mean, I fell out of love. Enchanted was my first published novel. And by the time it got published, I hated it. Um, and I warned Tempest that this might happen because you have to go over your baby over and over and over and pull it apart and put it back together. And I just, I, I hated my own book and it was the, the book of my heart. And I, I how does this happen? 
but at my launch party, Katie and I read a chapter together, which was amazing. And the uh, Brilliance audio rep brought the audiobook to the launch party. So I got to listen to my own book on the bus on the ride home from my launch party. And I cried because it Katie made me lo- made me love my book again. Oh, that's good. So I, I, she was my, has always been and always will be my role, role model. Katie, I miss you. Um, and yeah, when the escape artists started poking at me, you know, hey, can you do this for Cast of Wonders? Can you do this for what? They just launched a new one called Cats Cast, and I narrated the very first story. I'm so honored. That story is so cute. I got, I got to do the voices for seven different cats, and it's absolutely. Oh my amazing. god. <laughs> but I love it. I I love it. It's not, you know, it doesn't make me a ton of money. It's just, it's really something I love to do. And I'm, I'm honored that they continue to ask me to do it because it's just, it really is just a lot of fun. That's great. That's great. And I'm sure you're good at it. Well, he I is know. very good. Like I, have, I, I believe that I have listened to so many, like of the, the stories that she has narrated and I'm always just like, yes, I love it so much. And, um, like there was, there was also one oh, one time I asked her to like do something for me. I was like, please record this, and she's like, I will go into my little booth that I have, and I will make this for you. And it came out so great, and I was like, man, this is awesome. Of course, she has a little booth. I, oh, yeah, I, I have a little in my closet. You know, it's. T- <laughs> I just have like this screen here. Like that's all I have. Because- this is it. Yeah, <laughs> this, this is your whole life right here. <laughs> well, guys, I think we're out of time. Um, and I, which is too bad because there's so much other things I wanted to talk I about. I know, you'll have to invite us back because I love talking. We'll have, we'll have to have you guys back again. Yeah. You guys are wonderful. Thank you so much for taking time to join us here on Fast Forward. And I just want to let you know that uh, this is Mike Zipser for everybody at Fast Forward saying get vaccinated, wear a mask, do all that stuff. Yes. Bye-bye.